So hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's lecture. My name is Rosalind Rivas, my pronouns are she, her, and I am the Public Programs Manager at NYC Audubon. Um, as with all our lectures, this one will be recorded and later posted on our website for anyone to view. There will be closed captioning for this Zoom and in the recording as well. And we'll be sharing that recording with everyone who registered later this week. Throughout tonight's lecture, if you find yourself wanting to ask a question, please use Zoom's Q&A function. We'll take as many questions as we can after the presentation. For those who aren't familiar with N uh, NYC Audubon and our work, we are a grassroots conservation nonprofit that works to protect wild birds and their habitat in New York City. Through research science, advocacy, education, and outreach, we work to make a city a more bird-friendly place and habitable for both birds and people. One of our education programs is this winter's lecture series with five monthly lectures on various topics related to conservation and urban birding. And another huge shout out and thank you to Claude and Lucien Block for their continued support of this series. This is the fourth and second to last lecture of the series, and I'm excited to, per in to introduce Yamina Naterotero as our guest speaker for tonight. Yamina currently works at the Environmental Leadership Program as a Roger Airliner Young or Ray Program Manager. They are a strong advocate for equity in education and conservation, especially having worked in high and low income school districts and being a proud lifelong Newark, New Jersey resident and Puerto Rican. Yamina has also been interviewed by various podcasts, education publications, and newspapers about topics such as urban birding and biodiversity, redefining what we mean by the outdoors and equitable environmental education. Before joining the Ray Fellowship team, Yamina worked at, NYC, at Audubon New York as an educator for NYC students, which is where we actually met. And we both worked in the National Audubon office downtown. Um, and Yamina is an all around awesome person, awesome person to bird with, and as well as to discuss pop culture with. So tonight she will be talking about why our urban green spaces are so important for birds as well as people. And with that, take it away, Yamina. Thanks, Rosalind. That was a really, really nice intro. Um, you kept like listing things I had done and I was like, oh yeah, I did do that. So good news is um, I'll be talking about a few of the different things that Rosalind mentioned. Um, so welcome to the magic of urban green spaces. Um, I am actually going to kick things off with a land acknowledgement. I am um, currently in New Jersey. Um, which is the land of the um, Lene Lenape. Um, this is pulled from their website. Um, if you are calling in, or if you're sorry, if you're watching from New York, um, New Jersey, uh, this is, you know, our tribal lands. If you are not and you don't know, I'm actually going to put a link in the chat. Um, it is a page you can use to figure out whose tribal lands you are on um, and uh, go to pages to see like what land acknowledgements, recognitions they ask for. So the land upon which ga we got, the land upon which we gather is part of the traditional territory of the Lene Lenape called Lenape Hoking. The Lenape people lived in harmony with one another upon this territory for thousands of years. During the colonial era and early federal period, many were removed west and north but some remain among the continuing historical tribal communities of the region. The Nanticoke Lenny Lenape tribal nation, the Nanticoke of Millsboro, Delaware, and the Lenape of Cheswold, Delaware. We acknowledge the Lenny Lenape as the original people of this land and their continuing relationship with their territory. In our acknowledgement of the continued presence of Lenape people in their homeland, we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief, Tamanend, that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. If you come are calling in from a different um, tribal land, feel free to to put that in the chat um, so we can all make sure we're we're doing our acknowledgments and recognitions. All right. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, Rosalind covered a, a good amount of this. So um, 
My pronouns are she, they. Um, I am currently program manager at ELP for the Ray Fellowship Program. I did work at Audubon, New York, not New York City Audubon. Um, not that there's anything wrong with New York City Audubon. It's just that I had that conversation a lot of times. Um, originally from Newark, family from Puerto Rico. Um, and just a little fun, fun tidbits. Uh, I really like puns. I really like bad puns. Um, I have two dogs. Unfortunately, I lost one this past spring. Um, but these are my three Bostons and I love them very much. And of course, I am a birder. Um, and birder, however you choose to define that. Um, for me, I love birds. Uh, the cherry on top is that I try to ID them, but that isn't really necessary. All right. What is your favorite local park? So let's take a second. Um, please put that in the chat. I really want to see what people's um, favorite local parks are. Um, maybe I can learn about some new spaces. <laughs> Pelham Bay, that's your local park. Nice. <laughs> that's lucky. Lighthouse Park, Roosevelt Island, Forest Park, Randall's Island, Target Rock National Wildlife Refuge. There's so many parks I don't know. Inwood, Fort Greene, uh, Jamaica Bay, Inwood. Oh, New York Botanical Garden, Astoria Park. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shout out Astoria Park. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, sorry. So my favorite local park, uh, I'm in New Jersey. So I really love Weequahic Park. Um, as you can see here, it's relatively big. Um, it's really accessible. Uh, there's a track all the way around. Um, parts of it are hilly, but for the most part, it's a very accessible um, space. Thank you for sharing um, all of the awesome parks that, that you all frequent. All right, next question. Um, what do you picture when you hear the term the outdoors. So let's, um, I'll give you all some time to think about this. Feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, if you don't want to, just in your mind, um, what do you picture when you hear the term the outdoors? Many, many trees, trees, forest, river, upstate New York, woodland hiking trails, fresh air, trees, natural spaces, lots of trees, my backyard. Um, blue for sky, green for plants, trees, gardens, woodlands, green space, walking through the hills with my family. That's lovely. Thank you for sharing. Just being out, but I guess in a bigger sense, woods, trails. Thank you all for sharing. Um, cold air, winter. Yeah. Uh, I like it. I don't, I'm assuming you don't, but I do like <laughs> not indoors. That's a great answer. Exactly. So um, uh, one of the ways in which we sort of look at um, how society in general defines certain things uh, are Google image searches. And this seems kind of basic, but it's actually super helpful. So if you go to Google and you type in outdoors, you get pictures like this. Um, and then here's more of the um, search images. So these spaces are obviously beautiful. That's great. But some things to think about when we're looking at these pictures are um, how accessible are these places? Uh, can you take public transportation to these spaces? Uh, are they accessible to the disabled community? Um, will black, brown, queer people feel comfortable visiting these spaces? Obviously, there is not a universal answer. Um, however, I think these things aren't really taken into account um, when we think of this very narrow definition of what the outdoors is. And as we all know, there are so many different ways to engage with nature, different ways to, to be in the outdoors. Um, why is this an important conversation to have? Why am I talking about this? Well, um, when we place more ecological value on specific spaces, um, we're more likely to care for them and ignore the spaces of less ecological value in the communities around them. Um, direct experience has a strong influence on people's behavior. So if you're hearing about nature that's all the way over there, 
uh, you're less likely to care about it than you are to care about your local park, you know, where you hang out with your friends or read a book by yourself or however you like to enjoy it. So it is absolutely important that we define um, our ecological identity in our own communities, um, not just the outdoors. Um, Emotional involvement and investment is also a really big part of people um, engaging in more green behavior. So again, if if someone's like, you know, we got to protect those mountains, intellectually, yeah, we know that's important. However, we feel it more when it's someplace that we know and love and frequent. Urban green spaces matter to people. Um, so just some tidbits as to why um, urban green spaces are important. Um, so it's estimated that 83% of the US lives in urban areas. Um, and by 2050, 89% of the US population and world population is gonna live in urban areas. So we're talking about a huge, huge percentage of the people on this planet living in cities. Um, and these are just, if anyone, you know, afterwards um, has any questions, these are some of the, um, these are the documents um, from where I, I found these statistics. Let's talk about environmental injustice. So um, it is, you know, we need to note when we have these conversations that everyone is not impacted or affected by environmental injustice the same way, at the same rate, to the same um, extreme. One of these examples um, is the, you know, the, the aftermath of, of redlining. So um, a lot of people know redlining as um, the practice of banks not giving bank loans to potential Black homeowners. Um, but it's a little bit more insidious and a little bit more deeper than that. So really when the government was mapping out the United States, and this is um, Virginia, um, they would outright rank the safety and importance of neighborhoods um, and predominantly black and brown neighborhoods um, were considered riskier. Um, they were not considered worth investing in, um, neither the people nor the actual spaces. Um, so here we're looking at this map. Um, we've got uh, the redlining, actual redlining. So um, green is, you know, like great. Uh, blue is like, okay. Yellow is like, it's on the decline. Um, and D is, it's risky. Keep in mind that on the decline just meant that there were black and, and brown people moving into those neighborhoods. So we've got the picture here of the different neighborhoods um, next to which we have pictures of um, heat. So these are infrared images of these spaces and you can see the brighter colors are hotter. Um, green here is um, uh, parks and like green spaces in general. Um, so you can sort of see these blue and green spaces are greener. And then black is pavement. So again, you can see the overlap between red and yellow and pavement. Um, and again, um, if you know anyone later on wants any of the um, links to these documents, um, I can 100% share those with you. Okay, um, so, oh, uh, sorry, my, okay, sorry, my notes disappeared. Um, so it looks like this is Richmond, Virginia. Um, I would have to look at the actual article to get any more specific than that. Um, okay. Uh, Overheating. So we're all familiar with the concept of urban heat islands. Basically, cities are warmer than rural areas. Um, however, in New York City, um, uh, 
50% of the of New Yorkers who died from heat um overheating from 2000 to 2012 were black um which is double like their share of the population um so it's not just that urban heat islands um are a problem which of course they are it's also that um they're hitting certain demographics harder um especially um the black community uh, and again um resources um where the data comes from and where um the information um, I shared comes from. Um, and then we're looking at air quality. Um, so again, um, racial and ethnic minorities, as well as lower income groups in the US are a higher risk of premature death from exposure to air pollution, air pollution um, more so than other demographics and more so than um, high income groups. And so here we can sort of see this relatively complicated um, graph. Uh, red is industry and right there you can sort of see that jump. Um, and this goes back to that redlining thing where factories, warehouses, highways are put through neighborhoods that are not as valuable, which typically um, means that they have a, a high population um, of black individuals. Urban green spaces matter to birds. Um, so, uh, 20% of all of the known bird species live in cities. Um, and this is from, um, eBird, uh, this is from 2014. Um, so who knows if it's more, um, all right. What is the strangest or most surprising place? you've seen a bird. Um, so we're talking about birds in cities um, and it doesn't have to be in a city, um, but was did you ever go on a bird outing and saw a bird that you didn't expect or you saw any bird in like a random spot? Um, please feel free to share your, um, your anecdotes in the chat. Um, I will be sharing two anecdotes, um, a pigeon inside a ferry boat. Yeah, those pigeons just ride public transportation, Home Depot, uh, Northern um, Perula in front of the building on the sidewalk. Um, so just Northern Perula is a neotropical warbler, um, really beautiful bird. And sometimes in New York City, they just, or in cities, they kind of just, hang out there. Um, the Woodcocks in Bryant Park, uh, Starling in someone's chimney, um, Egret or Heron from the train through the Meadowlands. You should not be surprised. The Meadowlands is amazing. Great birding. Um, lesser yellow legs on Broadway. Uh, <laughs> all kind of fire escape. These are great. Thank you so much um, for sharing these. Black and white warbler in front of my school. Did I teach you? I remember that. Um, house sparrows nesting right on top of the doorway of a public bathroom. Yeah, these urban birds, um, they don't they don't mess around. Um, so uh, some of my anecdotal um, pieces of evidence. The rusty blackbird seen here um, is uh, awesome. It's a beautiful bird. Um, they're also like rapidly, rapidly in decline. Um, this is so this might be older it's what they're puzzled as to what is the cost and really we know most of it is habitat loss so rusty blackbirds really like wet um wooded areas so um i you know am in new jersey um newark um i lived close to branchbrook park um which is a large park uh in newark you can see um green and then just surrounded by um basically suburbs um i you know when the pandemic started as everyone else did just was constantly birding and one day um i was fortunate enough to hear um a bunch of rusty blackbirds and um i looked over and they were 
in this area. Um, keep in mind, this is a major road. There's a gas station here. There's a light rail station. Um, so these rusty blackbirds found habitat in an urban park, habitat which is in decline. Um, so again, this is anecdotal, but the, the point of it is that um, birds need as much habitat as possible and urban habitat is just as good, um, sometimes even better when you're migrating for um, a long distance than traditional bird habitat. Uh, second um, anecdote, and this one's a fun one. This is from my days at National um, Abingdon uh, Square Park. Uh, it's this tiny, tiny little corner um, in the West Village. Um, we're sitting around the office. Uh, we hear that there's a fun bird in Abingdon Park. We all go and um, we see a Virginia rail. Um, only Virginia rail I've ever seen. Uh, so the park was being maintained. Um, they were moving the dirt and the rail stopped to get some, some grubs and some food. Um, and again, this isn't something you would expect. Um, it's just sort of a reminder that when you are a bird and you're flying however many miles, thousands of miles, all of these green spaces are like an oasis to you. Um, so they are all valuable to us and to birds. Um, so I am going to highlight some, um, uh, some of the lesser known um, birding spots in, in New York City. Um, we all know Central Park, it's awesome. We all know Prospect Park and, and um, Jamaica Bay, um, and those are great. And there are some other spots that I think also deserve, deserve some love. Um, so in no particular order, um, we've got McCul McGulrick and McCarran in Greenpoint. Um, so here is an overview of Greenpoint. We've got uh, McGulrick here, McCarran here, um, and you can check out McGulrick and then walk over to McCarran. Um, So this is a uh, part of McCarran. Um, so when you first enter it from that side, um, this spot right here, there's something about this spot. Um, it has uh, lots of understory. Um, so birds, you know, they love understory. There's leaves, there's yummy insects. Um, lots of fun stuff underneath. Um, so they, the, the sparrows and such will hang out there and then you'll have migrating birds, um, up in the trees. So warblers, um, we got a tanager one time, mind you, none of this is guaranteeing that you'll see these birds, but it's just, it's kind of fun to, to keep an eye out for these things. Um, also, sorry, just going back to this map, um, McGulrick is tiny. It's really great though. Uh, we've got um, red-tailed hawks. Um, you can see peregrine falcons flying by. There's lots of um, tall churches and so they like the spires. Um, and if you are beginning um, to, you know, you want to learn how to observe birds, um, don't knock pigeons. They're awesome. There's a lot of variety in them. Um, they don't leave. So you can really sit there and practice observing birds. Um, with pigeons and starlings um, and house sparrows. Um, and then one of the bonuses of um, McCarran is that on the weekends, there's a farmer's market there. So you can look for birds. Um, you can look for the um, red-tailed hawk nests. Um, they are on the lights at the top around the stadium. Um, and then you can get some delicious produce. Uh, next stop, uh, Madison Square Park in Manhattan. Uh, I have not had the pleasure of um, visiting this park yet. Um, however, uh, I know New York City Audubon does programming there um, and has a great relationship with them. And I think that this is a really good example of a green space 
um, that is bird habitat and is also just used to meet the needs of the local community. So they have public speakers, there's a botanical book club, uh, they have a seed swap. And like I said, um, New York City Audubon guides lead tours there. Um, so this is a community resource with amazing free programming that you can also, you know, you can go birding. So um, I went to eBird um, just to pull up some of the things that you can see there. This is a really great resource for figuring out where you want to go. Um, so those are some of the current birds. And then I also wanted to spotlight um, fall migration. Um, you can see some fun stuff passing through. So some warblers, thrushes, um, all of these gorgeous birds. All right, next up, uh, Astoria Park. Um, so Astoria Park, you can see there's one bridge here. It's it's like next to two bridges. Um, and those are awesome for uh, peregrine falcons. Um, they like to hang out up there. Sometimes they'll nest up there. Um, it's also next to um, water. So you'll get uh, um, ducks and geese um, and all this fun stuff gulls um and um oops sorry um monk parakeets so um some of you might know um there are random um colonies of monk parakeets around the city uh they are at um Astoria Park as well um oh sorry I have so many tabs open okay um, oh, and there's amazing Greek and Middle Eastern food in that neighborhood. So again, um, one of the amazing things of about birding in these urban spaces or really just like visiting these urban green urban spaces is that um, you can make this awesome day of it, do some sightseeing, um, eat some delicious food, um, pick up any, I don't know, tchotchkes. Um, so lots of great stuff in all these different neighborhoods. Um, we have Concrete Plant Park. Um, again, not one that I have visited. Um, Rosalind, who is from the Bronx, um, recommended it to me and I looked it up and it really is just absolutely amazing. So um, this is built on the site of a concrete plant that operated from the 1940s to 1987. Um, the park was acquired by Parks in 2000. Um, and it's really just like a love project of the community, um, the Bronx River Alliance, the Parks Department, um, and they just reestablished salt marshes um, where there was trash and tires. Um, so the I went on eBird again, and the first eBird list is from 2019, which is pretty recent. Um, so uh, this park was really established 2009. Um, we have eBird list from 2019. Why, why do, would it be a great idea to just start birding this recently developed park built on remediated lands? What do we think we as a community, the science community, you as a person would get out of regularly birding this park um, for the next couple of years. Establish a baseline. Yeah, notice trends, show the value of having restored this place, showing how many birds use it, evidence that green spaces are important. New species will discover it, right? So the longer this is established here, um, the more friends, visitors will get. Um, it's also, you know, proof that rehabilitating, remediating these spaces um, is not only great for the community, but it's great for like the ecological community. Um, so any citizen scientists out there looking for a project, this could potentially be one of them. Um, thank you all again for um, your, your responses. Um, all right, and sorry. 
Uh, so this is a personal favorite of mine. Um, Culver Vox in Coney Island, this park. Um, I knew like lifelong Coney Island residents who didn't even know this park existed. Um, it isn't the most easily accessible by train. It is accessible by train. You just have to walk a little bit um, or take a bus there. Um, but it does have a parking lot next door. Um, Culver Vox Park is actually named after the architect who helped design Central Park, Prospect Park, Fort Green Park. Um, and then famously and mysteriously, um, he went on a stroll one day and then disappeared. The story does not have a good ending, so I won't wrap it up in case there are any um, kids or, or sensitive people in the group. Um, so this park, uh, again, was built on a former landfill. Um, I will say the water is still in need of remediation. Um, there have been instances of people going into the water and unfortunately um, it isn't good. It's still toxic, it can make you sick. Um, this is why that push for environmental justice is so important. Um, but despite all of that, um, it's got a wide variety of habitats, um, which is why it's so great. So uh, let's go on a tour of Culver Fox. Um, so here, uh, well, first of all, the parking lot's right here, but this is one of the entrances. This is a really overgrown spot, um, great for birding. Um, you've got, again, that understory, um, lots of grubbies. If you're like a small bird, you, you, you're hidden from potential predators. Um, the park has made an effort to install um, native plants. Uh, we love native plants. Um, they're good for the environment and they're good for birds and they're beautiful to look at. Um, so there are some native plants here. Unfortunately, there is also a lot of invasives, but um, you can see some really fun stuff right in here if you're patient. Um, so moving along, um, we've got this walk right here. Um, so the fields tend to be filled with geese um, and you can sort of keep an eye out on the tree line um, to see some fun stuff hopping around. Um, this is a gravel parking lot. Um, however, some of you might know this, but there are birds like killdeer um, who really like nesting on, on gravel parking lots um, on gravel period and like hanging out on gravel. So um, again, you can find stuff straight on the gravel um and it's also surrounded by trees and so there's that you know saying that birds love edges they really do um so this is basically surrounded by edges and you can just sort of keep an eye out for um any birds there uh this is um mud flats so this is a tidal um mud flat so that means that um come uh, low tide you can check out um, which shorebirds are there. Um, there's usually herons and egrets there. Um, it is unfortunately in need of some TLC. Um, so I know that there are some groups that do cleanups. Um, that's uh, an option too, or you can look for opportunities to do so. Um, and then um, finally, you're looking out into um, uh, Graves Head Bay. Sorry, I did not write that down. You're looking out into the water, so um, you can see uh again ducks, geese um across this um from from Culver Vox's Kaiser Park, which is a beach. So you can look for um more shorebirds, um gulls, terns. Um, this is an estuary, and it's a space for um fish and other species to come um, and um, breed. Uh, so it's just this really amazing ecological treasure um, hidden in Coney Island. Um, and then for those of us who want to know what you could see there, um, these are some recent lists. So as you can see, um, lots of awesome ducks and shorebirds 
um, and geese, uh, and then come um, spring migration. Again, we've got orioles and warblers and sandpipers and really just um, so many different species um, of birds. Um, so that is it for me. Um, we can, there we go. Uh, we can now, um, if you want to ask any questions, um, if you want me to clarify anything or go back or what have you, um, I would, I would love to do that. Thank you so much, Yamina. That was amazing. You did such a great job uh, highlighting great urban parks in the city and also talking about how important it is to have urban parks for both people and wildlife. Um, so we are, uh, I see one question here from Jane Politi or Politi. Um, so do waiting birds survive there? I think uh, that we're talking about Calver Bow Park. I believe maybe in the first spot you were talking about. Um, Jane, if you'd like to clarify it all, um, feel free to put it in the chat. But um, do you see many waiting birds in, in that park in Coney Island? Uh, waiting birds? Yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry, I had to think about. So yeah, oyster catchers, um, like I said, herons, um, willets, uh sandpipers sanderlings sanderlings sorry i forgot which one you get in mudflats i think it's sanderlings um so yes you can see um waiting birds um you can always go online and look up when low tide is um and make an effort to show up during mm -hmm. low tide nice yeah, and I also see that there was a comment that apparently it's also a horseshoe crab uh, spawning site. And it is. I missed that. Yeah, the queen of, of horseshoe crabs here. He and. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, oh, follow-up question. Do you happen to know when the water uh, is polluted, or the most polluted, I guess, during the year? I mean, as you've mentioned, it's been um, being restored uh, slowly but surely, right? Um, but I guess I, I mean, if I were to guess, I guess summer, right? Because everyone's out there. And they so, I mean, when I mention, when I say polluted, I mean, in the seventies and eighties, um, factories literally would dump their waste into this water. Um, and even past when those laws were, were enacted um, to protect this, this land, um, some companies and in organizations and, and businesses continue to dump um, garbage into this water. Mm -hmm. um, Coney Island also at one point was just like a hot spot for tourists. So you had amusement parks and hotels. So you've got all those people um, in like the fifties, um, like just leaving their garbage around. Um, so I, as for time of year, I don't know, um, but I will say this, it's been accumulating for decades. Um, so yeah, just ne never, at no point in the year should you go into the water <laughs> without protection. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I see a great question from Mika Charles. How do we get more native plants planted in our parks? Is there an organization to support besides Audubon, obviously? <laughs> Um, so I think a lot of parks have alliances and conservancies, um, and that is probably, um, a good place to start. Um, you can use the Audubon, um, resources to do research as to why, um, you should use native plants, um, as a specific org, I, yeah, besides, I'm in New Jersey, so I know that there is a native plant um, society here in New Jersey. I'm not sure if there's the equivalent in New York um, or wherever you are. Um, I would just, yeah, start Googling like native plant organizations, park um, alliances, conservancies, um, reach out to your local Audubon so that you can become an advocate and get that language and bring it to um, the change makers and the decision makers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. And uh, 
similarly, how do you go about discovering these parts, these green spaces? So I am really lucky. I did education. I did bird conservation education in the city. So a lot of these spots I discovered through work. Um, we would just go on field trips in parks close to the schools. However, um, the eBird app, which is awesome, um, recently, not so recently, recently installed um, a function called Explore. Um, and you can literally pull that up and it's a GPS and you can look for birding hotspots, green spaces near you. Um, I really love that, especially, you know, if I'm not in like my usual stomping grounds or if I decide I want to try um, checking out a new green space, um, that resource uh, really, really um, is clutch. Um, and just a reminder, the eBird app is free. Um, and there is the eBird website, so it's accessible via different um, platforms. Yes, definitely. Um, what about for, well, you have experience working with kids and young students. Um, any tips for birding with kids and uh, young students in the city? Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned before, um, don't knock urban birds. Um, they're awesome. And also, um, they cooperate. So uh, you can sit and like watch pigeons and they come in different color morphs and you can practice um, making observations on their colors, the sounds that they make, their behaviors, um, house sparrows and, and um, uh, starlings nest everywhere. Um, so that's a really great way to just show an example of, um, of birds that nest. Um, really just getting outside and looking at stuff is a lot of fun. Um, uh, scavenger hunts are great. Um, nature journaling is really fun. Um, anything that gets kids to, or anyone really, this is for everyone, anyone that, anything that gets you to just sort of stop and notice your surroundings, um, turns into a lot of fun yeah and you've made plenty of art like collages from inspired by nature right I do yeah so <laughs> yeah uh, nature art is another great way to do that um either out in the in the space with a nature journal or you know you know you go out you pick up some leaves off the ground or be mindful to not tear anything down but you can pick up stuff from the ground and you can use that to make art as well nice and so a question, a personal question for you. What, well, one, what is your favorite bird? And two, what is your spark bird? Mm. Spark? So spark bird is much easier. Um, just the educator in me has to say, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, spark bird is um, the bird that really um, got you into birding. Um, so uh, my spark bird is the white-breasted nuthatch. Um, they are adorable um, and they make really funny sounds. Um, and it's also a bird with a very distinctive behavior. So um, they will really just like walk up like down trees and they'll hang out kind of upside down, um, which is a field mark. Um, it's a way of identifying birds. Um, and it was uh, one that I remembered before I started working in bird conservation from a previous experience. And I think that's when the light bulb went off in my head um, that birds do amazing things and look amazing. And, and if you want to learn how to identify birds, there are all these great little um, quirks about birds that you can remember. Um, so white-breasted nuthatch is my spark bird. Favorite bird is, um, it's a really, really, really hard question. Uh, it's winter. Um, winter is weird duck season. So I like ruddy ducks. Um, they're cute. They're little. Uh, you know, I, I have family in Puerto Rico. I'm lucky enough that I get to go birding in Puerto Rico. Um, so um, I like our endemics over there. Um, really just, it depends on the mood <laughs> um, and the, and the time of year, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, 
it would you mind also I, we got a question or about um that site that you use for uh finding your native land that we're on um would you mind putting that in the chat again oh, oh just, absolutely uh, so people can see that it's a great site i love using it and it shows pretty much the world not just mm -hmm. the us yeah. um right, okay oh were you gonna say something um, just that it's a great resource and it, like I mentioned earlier, it does have links mm -hmm. to like the tribal um, organizations um, page. And so um, you can get information from like the source instead of, you know, trying to figure it out on your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We got another question. So any tricks to feeding birds, but not the rats? <laughs> Ooh. Is that possible? <laughs> Any tricks for feeding birds, but not rats? I mean, the common thing is adding pepper to your food. Um, birds uh, have less taste buds, um, so you can make their food spicy. Um, it's not guaranteed, but I, I do know it helps. Um, other than that, I think squirrels and and rats are just unfortunately gonna they're gonna show up yeah mm -hmm. yeah if anyone else wants to put anything in the chat um <laughs> i would welcome those suggestions yeah if anyone has any tricks yeah um yeah i know it's always hard for to make a feeder squirrel proof <laughs> mm -hmm. make it there any any way possible mm -hmm. yeah um okay we have another from Jarius James. Do you have any input or comments on the impact of endangered bird presence on pressuring local buildings or orcs to treating their windows with bird-friendly decals or stickers, which is actually one of our uh, NYC Audubon's big projects in the city. We always go out to, uh, to, to neighborhoods to find out what, bird, what buildings are killing birds with the most glass, but and yeah, but yeah, let me know what you have to say about that. Um, my first answer to that is not everyone loves birds and that's fine. Um, you can behave in ways that are bird friendly without being obsessed with birds like some of us are. Um, bird safe glass uh, is, um, I believe it's been shown to reduce um, energy use just because of the way that it reflects heat and like retains um like the ac um so you kind of just sometimes you have to put the birds aside and really think about how um this would benefit the people there um in terms of decals um they don't have to be official bird friendly decals you can literally just put cute drawings on your windows or or whatever anything that breaks up the glass um so again that is a an affordable um way to make glass or a building bird friendly and um a beautification project um so i would say however you are advocating for birds you always always have to keep in mind that your audience might not love birds for whatever reason um and you might have to connect with them um in a different way yeah that's a great point like there are so many ways you can relate to people and connect to people and even though to try to get to the same goal and um yeah maybe it's it's by appealing to how much they love their parts like, instead mm -hmm. of just the birds yeah um yeah and i just added in the chat uh, a link to our website where we sh uh, share a lot of different ways that you anyone can make uh the city more bird friendly including a volunteer project that we have about monitoring windows uh, called project safe flight so that link is in the chat and you can look at it if you ever want to learn more um Okay, here's an interesting question from Jill Hoskins. Have some birds become tolerant to urban noise? So much traffic and construction in Lower Manhattan, for example. Um, yeah, there's so much. 
I mean, you would have to assume so if if we're walking around during migration and there's, um, I think my bo- like a f- colleague said that one day he saw a cattle egret like on and like one of those tiny triangles. So keep in mind that um, we've got birds who are here who are residents year round. Um, they definitely have adapted. We have birds that are flying over for migration um, and they're exhausted. Uh, They've been flying for miles um, and maybe even days. Uh, They're hungry. They need water. Um, So these birds, they're just going to land wherever they can get food and water. Um, I, you know, that's the time of year when you can, I don't recommend doing this regularly, but you can get like pretty close to migratory birds just because they're so exhausted and they won't pay attention to you. Um, so I assume residential birds have, um, adapted and migratory birds just are too tired and hungry to, to really care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just as a fun fact, yes, I mean, totally with any kind of city wildlife, there's, they're totally used to urban life. Like you could get so close to a squirrel and like they, they don't even like glance your way, but, um, for birds. Uh, just uh, to share a really cool study that I once heard about, it's they have actually even adapted to sing at different times, knowing when traffic is heaviest. So uh, especially during rush hour in the morning, for example, they would start earlier to try to beat that <laughs> rush hour um, and even sing in higher pitches because that carries farther. Isn't that amazing? That's so crazy. <laughs> Very yeah. cool. Um, okay. So does anyone have any more questions before we wrap up? We are nearing the top of the hour. Um, I do want to address a comment in the chat, um, calling me out, rightfully so, for not mentioning Staten Island. (laughs) Staten Island is awesome. It's also not the most accessible place. Um, It's not easy getting there. And then I think it isn't cheap getting there either. Um, which is the only reason why I didn't mention it. Um, I do love birding um, in Staten Island. I have been fortunate to do so. Oh, the ferry is free. Just on it. Thank you. So the ferry to Staten Island is free. Um, uh, Staten Island has um, the green belt um, and it has a, um, shoot. (laughs) It has a, um, botanical garden slash museum that's really great and the name is escaping me but that's actually free to go visit um and it's snug harbor Snug Harbor. yep um thank you uh snug harbor is beautiful um it's free to visit um and it has a variety of habitats um so i highly recommend that um and apparently yeah apparently i don't know anything about sand island and it's free to go yeah, I mean, I'm from the Bronx. It would take me like literally three hours to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, speaking of Snub Harbor, not to give spoilers away, but we are going to be going there in the spring. So watch out for the, the event calendar when that happens. Um, oh, I just also want to put the link to Project Safe Light, if you want to learn more about that, um, right in the chat here. There you go. Uh, yeah, we do, uh, you can read more about it, but we do it every spring and fall. Um, okay, so we are getting close to that time. So unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap up now, um, but I could talk all night <laughs> here. Um, okay, so yes, thank you so much again, Yamina, for sharing your time with us and your expertise. My this pleasure. is always, it's always so great to hear about uh, Native uh, native plants, the green urban areas, parks. Oh, it's amazing. And what they can do for us and wildlife. Um, so, and thank you everyone here for joining um, us here. If you like this one, check out the next lecture, uh, The Colorful World of Hummingbird Feathers with Gabriela Venable, um, which is taking place on March 7th. She'll be presenting a really cool study she conducted on hummingbird plumage color, which found some uh, very striking results. So let me put that in the chat right now. But also, speaking of doing very cool things in urban areas, we 
NYC Audubon, we uh, just opened applications to our artist in residency um, uh, program. So if you are an artist or know an artist um, or know anybody who might be interested, you should check it out because we uh, offer six months of uh, unlimited use for uh, an an, um, exhibition space and you can share your art, whatever kind of medium um, with Governor's Island, with the city. Um, It's so great. I will also put that in the chat right now. Lots of links coming your way. Okay. And we of course have tons and tons of uh, events going on all the time, all year round. And so you can check out the parks that Yamina just talked about tonight and more in many of our bird outings and classes, which you can look at in our calendar of events here. Watch out for the spring because there's gonna be like literally 200 events. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Well, thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us tonight. And we will, I hope to see you next time and out in the outdoors as we now know how to, to think about that. All right. Well, have a great night, everyone. See you later. Thanks.